Are you super excited? It's Women Entrepreneurship Week at Berkeley College and all over the world. So today we are going to bring you the most dynamic women in the state of New Jersey. And I would say also the most dynamic women from around the globe, literally. Let's give a shout out to our panelists. Thank you for joining us today. I like that. The, the crowd is getting a little more alive as the minutes tick by. So we're going to be, by the time this event is over, we're going to be ready to take on the world. Welcome to Women Entrepreneurship Week at Berkeley College. This is our second event in seven days. Our first event in New York City last week was off the charts. And it set the tone for the momentum of women coming together to support each other, to share our stories, and to inspire each other to achieve our goals. Not only our goals, but just better lives for the future for ourselves and for our loved ones. I want to give you a glimpse of that event. Will, are you here? Will, Will, let's take it away here. We, we just happen to have a, a little video for you because we want to get the party started with a flashback to last week, seven days ago, Women Entrepreneurship Week at Berkeley College in Manhattan. This was an amazing day. Where else can you bring together some of the most dynamic women in the world here at Berkeley College talking about women entrepreneurs and inspiring the future? Entrepreneurship, women, and women's it. power is incredibly important in 2019. I feel like women, we came so far, especially in business. Back in the day, we didn't have any of this. We couldn't come together and empower each other in these type of spaces. So it just shows how far we've come. As women, we have to be able to seize on opportunity and to understand when necessity demands how to be inventive and creative. And having your own business allows you to do all those things. Thank you. We have, we have. We're going to find out how the superpowers, all the superpowers that each of the women in this room have and some of the men. Our chairman is actually uh, a mask, masked right here as a superman himself. <laughs> he gets an A plus for, for team spirit today for showing us his superpowers, Kevin Lewing. When we started in 2015, we were just over 20 organizations and uh, more some say 12 countries uh, that supported this event five years ago in collaboration with universities in New Jersey, starting with the Feliciano Center at Montclair State University. We were one of the founding sponsors of this event. And today there are more than 200 universities and colleges in 30 countries, 43 states, and the District of Columbia, Columbia celebrating Women Entrepreneurship Week events. I want you to know that this event is being broadcast live on our live stream network here at Berkeley College. And we thank our audiences uh, at home and here at the college at our six campuses in New York and New Jersey for tuning in this morning. We also want you to share this event on your social network. So please check the back of today's program for access to the Wi-Fi and any of our Twitter handle our Twitter handle is hashtag WEW2019. That's WEW2019 and at Berkeley College. Always keep the Berkeley College in there. We have Sasha with us today, who's a graphic artist with ImageThink, and she'll be drawing our event on the whiteboard that you see there. And then following this event, we'll be distributing a newsletter capturing all the highlights and the digital images from Sha Sasha's amazing work. You ready, Sasha? Yes. I would uh, say that that's the art of conversation, right? <laughs> I'd like to recognize our dignitaries here today. Uh, Deborah Hoffman, the Director of Development for the County of Passaic. Thank you for being with us, Deborah. <laughs> Patterson City Council President Maritza Devola. <laughs> Councilwoman and forming acting mayor former acting mayor of the city of Patterson, Ruby Cotton. Thank you for joining us today. 
I'd like to acknowledge our Berkeley, Colle our Berkeley College administrators in the house here today. Our campus operating officer, Linda Pinsky, she runs this house, okay, all of it. Uh, and uh, she's such a, a great supporter of women and of our students. You can't pass Linda by without her telling you a story of a student or opening an email in the morning of a, uh, a great uh, milestone that one of our students has reached. And Linda is the purveyor of good news always. And I would like to acknowledge our senior vice president of government relations, Terry Duda, who is with us. Our senior vice president of student success, Diane Racinos, one of our panelists. Karen Carpentieri, our Vice President of Human, Human Resources. Karen's here. And I, Eileen Greenfield, our Director of Media Relations. And this is the woman you need to know, Maria Ortega Cubas, because she's the Senior Director of Career Services. You need interns, you have job openings, Maria's the person to see, the point person. Everybody say hi to Maria. I'd like to also acknowledge our uh, chairman, Kevin Lewing, who you'll be meeting shortly, and our president, Michael Smith. And a woman who needs no introduction, Kelly Debsey, our director of communi communications and external relations. Kelly, you are the superstar with superpowers who put this event together for us, and I want to say thank you. And I have to share another big piece of news for today. Affinity Credit Union entered into a corporate partnership with Berkeley College to have 27 of their associates enter the MBA program at Berkeley College, which is housed here on our campus and online. Our School of Graduate Studies is in a neighboring building here on the campus. And so we have 20 affinity, uh, uh, 27 Affinity members in the MBA program, and we have 11 representatives from Affinity here today to enjoy this event. And the reason I want to mention this is because it's about the added value that, that our college is providing to the community and to companies that when you engage with the college, that our campus is your campus. You could take advantage of these events, whether you're in our MBA program or not in the MBA program, our campus is open to all. So I really want to acknowledge uh, Affinity and thank you for all the support here today. And I would like to give a shout out to Carlene Fletcher, the Assistant Vice President of Learning Development at Affinity. So thank you, Affinity. Please stand up, Affinity, stand. Tell us who you are. Yes, Good, thank you. The theme of today's event is Women in Leadership, Unleashing Your Superpowers. When I look into the audience, I see amazing women. I see women who have left their comfort zones and their native homelands to start new lives in the United States. They have to adapt to a new culture and a new language. I see female executives who hit a broken rung while climbing the career ladder. And in response, they started their own businesses. I see women empowering women through public service and socially responsible entrepreneurship. I see Berkeley College faculty educating the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs. I want to share and introduce you to some of these faculty members who, we have six faculty members who have brought classes here today. And you'll see students coming in and out because they have classes that they have to go to in between uh, this event. But I want to acknowledge Guy Adamo, Ruth Kaplan, Melissa Baralt, who is also one of our panelists here today. You know, Melissa, we had to invite you because you have such a popular following. <laughs> Nancy Kern and Nazareth Darakshan. Thank you for bringing your classes here today and for all you do to prepare our students and educate them for the future. There are, there are many inequities in the workplace and in society and working together, we must correct the inequity and injustice that reduce access to opportunity and upward mobility. 
The U.S. Department of Labor reports that a working college graduate, age 25 or older, earns 81% more than the median worker whose education didn't extend beyond high school. The closing of the college education gap with more women in college over the past two decades equates to as many women in the workforce with college degrees as men. That's 28.6 million women to 28.6 million men in the workforce with four-year college degrees. There was a report on this in the Wall Street Journal that I would uh, urge you to read uh, yesterday, actually, that will give you more details about these numbers. But even though we've narrowed the gap in terms of education, that doesn't equate to higher earnings for women. In the year 2019, there is still a large income difference between the genders. On average, women earn 82 cents to the dollar than their male counterpart in similar positions. That gap widens for African American women and Latina women. Minority and women-owned businesses are growing at an exponential rate, yet they are underfunded and have a difficult time raising capital. The lack of parity in providing opportunities for women in the management pipeline early in their careers is also holding women back. A report on women in the workplace by McKinsey and Company shows that for every 100 men promoted and hired to a management position, only 72 women are promoted and hired. This broken rung leads to more women getting stuck at entry-level jobs and fewer women becoming managers. 62% of manager-level positions are held by men, while 38% are held by women. And this lack of career mobility is blamed on the broken rung on the step to management. We can fix this rung because as women in leadership positions, once you attain those positions, you can influence change in your organizations. You can have your voice heard. That's what this day is about. Today, you will hear from women who will share their stories on how they have turned injustice and inequity to opportunity, and how they have fixed the broken rungs or risen up a different ladder to success. As I look into the audience, I see courageous women I see resilient women, I see brilliant women, and I see innovative women. Which one are you? Right answer, all of the above, all of the above. Let's make the most of this day and build on the momentum of all the women and the energy and the experience in this room. And I also want to thank you for making this a priority and invite you to continue with us on this journey to lifting women up across New Jersey, across the world. At this time, I'd like to introduce our chairman, Kevin Lewin. Well, actually, this is an imposter. This is not the Kevin Lewin I know. <laughs> Angela, these programs are so important to, to Berkeley College. Good morning. Welcome to Berkeley College and this amazing event. I love the theme for today, unleashing your superpowers. Some superheroes wear a mask to hide their true identity, but I don't see any of you wearing a mask today. That's a great start. How many of you remember the Powerpuff Girls? Anybody? <laughs> Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup. <laughs> They've come back now, but from 1998 to 2005, they were my daughter Courtney's favorite superheroes when she was in preschool and elementary school. They didn't wear masks to hide their identity, so I'm going to take my mask off as well. <laughs> what is your supernatural power? Do you know? Do others know, or do you keep it a secret? Let me tell you about the supernatural power of Berkeley College. At Berkeley College, we've been providing a career-oriented uh, education for women for almost 90 years. We have over 5,700 students and more than 60,000 alumni. 68% of, of our students are women, 
and we have over 400 military and veteran students. At Berkeley College, we offer an MBA, bachelor's, associate degrees, certificate programs, and non-degree professional courses at our campuses in New Jersey, New York, and through Berkeley College Online. Students can choose from more than 20 different fields. Berkeley College is among the top colleges in America for overall income mobility. The Equality of Opportunity Project based at Harvard University issued a mobility report card that ranked Berkeley College of New Jersey in the top 4% of 2,137 colleges nationwide for moving graduates out of poverty. That's fifth out of 49 colleges in New Jersey for overall income mobility. One of our supernatural powers is career services. We prepare students for the workforce, and we're very proud of our career services department where we have over 25 career counselors. Now, I don't know if there's any other uh, college that, that has that many career counselors, and if, if you do the math, um, that's a low ratio of, of students and, and graduates to career counselors. Our students can access assistance from the Berkeley College Office of Career Services at any point in their college career, and all of our graduates have access to lifetime career assistance. We'll not only help get them their first job, we'll also continue throughout their lifetime and their career to place them in additional jobs from time to time. Uh, Berkeley College also offers a career clothing boutique which seeks to prepare students for successful interviews and career opportunities by providing them with free professional clothing. I'd like to take this time to thank those of you who have do donated your new and gently used business attire today. We're, we're very appreciative. Our students are appreciative as well. I'd also like to thank our, our supernatural panelists and our outstanding Berkeley College staff who have put today's program together. At Berkeley College, every student has a name, a family, a dream. Our students and alumni contribute to the vitality of New Jersey communities. We are your neighbor. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce our hero, my hero here at Berkeley College, our president, Michael Smith. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Pretty good. Pretty good. Not bad for a Thursday, a long week with some, uh, some bad weather in the midst of it, but it's, it's good to have you here. I have to admit, um, my notes are not really aligned with what I was supposed to be. I thought today's symposium was going to be um, whether women should have the right to vote. <laughs> we laugh, right? We laugh. You know, it was, and next year is going to be the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. Uh, only for 100 years, women in the United States have had the right to vote. Amazing, right? Well, well let, let me tell you this. You've come a long way, baby. Hmm. <laughs> so last year, uh, last year was the 50th anniversary of that advertising. Those who are, old, who are older than 50 may remember uh, that campaign. There was an advertising campaign created by men on Madison Avenue uh, that said, you came a long way, baby. And what they were talking about, they were talking about how, you know, over, over at that point, it was almost 50 years that women had the right to vote. And how the men on Madison Avenue viewed women uh, and their, uh, how far they had come, at that point, 50, you know, 50 years ago, was a great achievement for women because uh, they had created a, a, a very slim cigarette for women, and women in the advertising were, were, were able to wear pantsuits. That's how far women came. I mean, how amazing is that, huh? Congratulations, women. But it, it, is anybody triggered by that? <laughs> as, as we say in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the common parlance that we have now, anybody triggered by that? Because you think about that, it's like, you know, it was a man's dominated world. I mean, it took 100, it took 100 years of effort, seriously, um, for the women's suffragette uh, effort to get to the 19th Amendment to vote. 100 years to do that. And even 50 years later, we're talking about women, how far they've come, baby, because their ability to wear pantsuits. So 50 years since then, what have we accomplished? And what, is, what is, has gone on? Today's a perfect example of, of what, you know, where we go and where we're headed. 
Berkeley College, you know, Kevin, uh, Kevin uh, Lewin gave an explanation of what Berkeley College is all about. I'll say it in slightly different terms. Berkeley College takes curated knowledge and we advance it into students and create skills and abilities in them to create lifelong success personally and professionally. That's what Berkeley does. Today's just a perfect example of us doing that again. This women's event here is going to present examples. And for our students that are here, they're going to see models. Because in essence, they're going to see on one end these panelists here who are talented, bright, skilled, present professional images and great you know, stories about where they're at and where they're coming from. But when the students, I'm asking the students that are here to listen very closely, because closely, because listen to the journey. Because you know, every, you know, every time we do this, I haven't seen or heard one panelist that said, it was handed to me on a silver platter, it was the easiest thing I've ever did. Um, anybody can do it. No, each panelist has their own unique journey and their own unique story as to where they came from and what they achieved. And that's what today is all about. Hearing the stories and the advancement of what, what goes on and where, where our individuals and where our students have the possibility to, to take themselves and where they have the opportunity to grow. One of the key things that's really, really interesting um, about uh, what goes on here is that, as Kevin mentioned, you know, over two-thirds of our students here are women at Berkeley College. And Berkeley College started almost 90 years ago as a, a effectively as a finishing school for women. And you think about how far we have come and how far we've evolved now. And even with the numbers and the metrics that were mentioned, like over, you know, uh, two-thirds of the students here at Berkeley College are females. Nationally, over 60% of the college-going students currently are women. Over 50% of the electorate is women. But in Washington, D.C., I think there, I think there, 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 some pride was being expressed because I think the number of women in, in, the, uh, in Congress went from around 24% to about 27%. It's okay, but I don't understand why why it's not doing better. Um, it, it's almost like a you know where you got your own slim cigarette and, and pantsuit you can wear now. The opportunity of knowledge, the skills, the abilities that are out there now in the workforce for those who are going to be on the panel today and those who are Berkeley College students now, we need to pick up the speed. We need to pick up the acceleration. We need to balance things out. There is a um, an author. Uh, who wrote, uh, Tom Peters, who wrote, um, and I'm, big, I'm a, a, a gigantic reader, he, well, he wrote one of the very first very, very popular business books back um, in the early 1980s, and it was called In Search of Excellence. Um, he profiled companies and about the things that companies did uh, to be successful. Now, a lot of those characteristics have changed over time. And over the last couple of years, Tom Peters has written a, a number of, of new books. But one of the very key themes that Tom Peters talks about all the time is the importance of organizations bringing women into leadership positions, not in a statistically minor or just to say, well, we've got a woman on the board or we've got a woman doing this, but really bring them in because if you are a marketer, if you want to go for ed educated individuals, why aren't you marketing to where your audience is? If you've got, you know, if your Madison Avenue advertising shop says you've come a long way baby and you're talking about women, you know, what they've achieved in that period of time, who better to ask than a woman and get their woman's insight? That's where the opportunities are, to have fair and reasonable decision making in Washington, D.C., which we probably could use a little bit at this point now, right? Mm -hmm. More, you know, I, I don't think we'd be hurt by having more women there, and I think it's going to create greater, greater and greater opportunities for us that are out there. So Tom Peters is talking about it. We're talking about it. Berkeley's certainly doing our share by educating our students and providing opportunities like this for them to see good role models. It's an, you know, we're, we're pairing women with entrepreneurship. And if I you know, did an independent survey of my students and just talked to them, you know, as I do in the hallways, and I accost them, and sometimes if, you know, if they bother them too much, they wind up running away from me because they know they're going to have to answer some questions. And I, I talk about when you're going to graduate, what are you studying, what, what's your plans when you graduate. But a question that gets answered more often than not, I, I, I how they answer the question is that they want to be entrepreneurs. Our panelists up here are entrepreneurs. They're going to see what it's like to be an entrepreneur. They're going to hear the story and the challenges that our students have in their lives and have had in their lives and will have in their lives are going to match up very similar with the panelists that are here today. So now the best part of my presentation. Um, uh, we adore our students here at Berkeley College. And I have the, uh, the great opportunity to introduce our next speaker, who's, who's uh, Penny uh, Betadalis, who is just an extraordinary, extraordinary student. Um, she's got a unique story, the kind of you know, path that she went on. She describes herself as a, as a non-traditional student. I just describe her as a student with experience. Um, 
she and one one of the really you know, neat things I was talking to her beforehand, and she worked in our communication. She worked part time in our communications department, and I said, you know, and th then that's you know Angela's team and and uh, those folks. And I said, tell me something like really embarrassing about them, and, and like so I can so I can up here and tell a story about them and embarrass them. And she's like, hmm, they're really really nice to me, and then she said like. On my very first day, they put a big bucket of, of candy on my desk. I said, they're trying to kill you. <laughs> so, but, Pe but Penny is, is one of our really special students. She's a student leader. Um, uh, she's been successful in life already. With her education here, we expect even more from her. Her mom's watching in Florida. Say hi, mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> Thanks for watching today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Penny. Thank you, President Smith. Thank you, Angela Harrington and Kelly Debsky for the opportunity being here today. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How's everyone feeling today? Good. good, good to be here, great. It is an honor to be standing here before you all today in company of such powerful women. Let's give a round of applause to all of us who are here today. As children, we are told by our loved ones our teachers and mentors, that we can be whatever and whomever we want to be. As children, we have soaring imaginations, pure hearts, and dreams that surpass our galaxy. As we grow into adults, we realize that those dreams change. Society changes how we think, how we act, and how we dream. One of my favorite quotes is people change people, Dr. King. Do I need to rise? No? <laughs> we all have obstacles that we must overcome. At the age of 22, I lost my father to cancer. At the age of 25, I lost my grandfather, who helped raise me, just as my father did. At the age of 27, I was diagnosed with a severe life-threatening disease where I was given six months to live. Four and a half years later, here I am before you all today. I persevered through all of these obstacles and I continue to fight each and every day as most of us do. The road is long, at times it's difficult, but we strive. Sometimes we need a shoulder to lean on and a helping hand to pull us forward. Knowing when to ask for help is our strength. My strength is my mother, my family, my peers, my mentors, and my family here at Berkeley. I chose to live life to the fullest while I have the privilege of doing so. I read these words once and they have stuck with me. As every chapter in our life comes to an end, don't cry because it's over, but smile because it happened. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Embrace life, find your silver lining in the midst of chaos. I decided to deck to take my decade of experience in the entertainment industry and start my own artist development company. The journey is ambitious and difficult, but it's also rewarding. After beginning this journey, I realized I needed to take it one step further. I decided to pursue my education here at Berkeley College to expand my knowledge and grow as both an individual and professional. Pursuing my degree in marketing communications is imperative to achieving my goals. This has been the best decision I have ever made. Attending Berkeley College has helped me grow in all sense of the word. I am one involved, as President Smith stated before. I'm the marketing manager for the Student Government Association. I am also a peer tutor for the Center of Academic Success. I have also founded and run the volunteer leadership program off our Paramus campus. This is a program that I am very proud of, very dear to my heart. Powered by the Student Development Campus Life Office, we empower students to learn event coordinating, marketing, management, and social responsibility through our community outreach sector. We do not just focus on our members' assets, but also help them target their weaknesses and build them into strengths. At the conclusion of this program, students will have work experience, a highlight on their resume, and a certificate of achievement. Surround yourself with people who inspire you. Surround yourself with people who will support your dreams. You are beautiful, you are strong, and you are worthy. Thank you to all of these powerful women 
who will stand before you today and empower you as well as inspire you to execute your dreams. Thank you. Penny, you are beautiful, you are strong, and you are worthy. <laughs> Um, we have to say hello to Penny's mom, Mirtha, who's in Miami. Hi. Everybody, come say hello. Oh Hi, Mirtha. <laughs> you raised an amazing daughter. Thank you for sharing her with us. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're going to assemble our first panel. Will our panelists uh, for panel number one please uh, come here to the table and take your seats? At this time, I would like to introduce Diane Racinos, who will be moderating the panel. Diane, as I mentioned earlier, is our Senior Vice President of Student Success here at Berkeley College. Let's take it away, ladies. Good morning. So before I introduce the panelists today, I'd like to share a, a revelation that I had last night watching the San Antonio Spurs and the New York Knicks. Not only was there a female referee on the court, but there was also Becky Hammond who played for the WNBA as an assistant coach for the San Antonio Spurs. So you can tell how much I've been watching professional basketball because I had no idea that she had been there for five years. It was funny, the commentators even mentioned that if the head coach was ever ejected, that it would be Becky Hammond that would most likely step into the head coach position over the other assistant coaches that they had. So whoever thought a woman would someday coach an NBA basketball team? I was more intrigued with the female referee I don't know if I was more intrigued hearing my son say, hey mom, there's a female referee, or the fact that there was a female referee. Um, but the, the players hovered over the referee. So I had to do a little research just to see exactly how many women referees there have been. And it's interesting because I've grown up watching basketball and the first referee was in 1997 which was 51 years after the NBA started. And since then, there have been, the NBA has been in existence for over 70 years. And since then, we now have six women referees. So, very interesting. Clearly, they have found their superpower and are not only changing the look of the MBA, but are really paving the way for other women. So I just found that to be interesting. I found it to be very relevant for today. So let's move on to our panelists. That's what it's all about today, hearing their story. So I'd like to introduce, we have Valeria Alo, who is the Director, Hispanic Entrepreneurship Training Program, Statewide Hisp Hispanic Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey. Welcome. Christine Cox West, partner and director of insurance brokerage, the Fortis Agency. Hello. Vanetta Hawkins, vice president, diverse segments, Northeast Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. Thank you. Jill Johnson, co founder and CEO, Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership. Welcome. Kate Muldoon, Regional Director, Small Business Development Center at William Patterson University. And Karen Pena, Founder, Our Way to Hope, CEO, Pena Tax Services, and Accountant Property Manager, Top Real Estate Investment, Inc. So to kick the panelists off, let's start with them giving us 
an overview of their organization and the journey that they took and where they are in their career today. And the majority of the panelists are business owners and social entrepreneurs or work in some aspect of banking and finance. So if you could take a few minutes and just tell us about your organization as well as your journey. We'll start with Valeria. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, it's a privilege for me to be here today with you with this amazing room filled with amazing people. I'm originally from Argentina. I came to this country in 2002, and it's been a journey, a long journey. I'm from a very small town in Argentina. Um, my streets where I lived were unpaved, and you're allowed to laugh if you want. We had dogs and cows walking down the street every day. That was my, my childhood. And I'm the first one in my family to go to college. My father did not finish high school. He had to start working when he was 11 years old. But I always heard from them, yes, you can do it. You can achieve any dreams that you put in front of you. We believe in you. So um, I decided to, to pursue a, a career in, a, a, in actually a degree, a degree in business administration and finance with um, and work at the same time because I had to pay for my own path. And the journey continued, and I came to the U.S. in 2002 after working a few years in Argentina. There was a huge crisis in 2001 in Argentina, and the door opened to go abroad. And my husband and I decided to come here for higher education, and that was a dream that I had, I would have never thought that I was going to have that opportunity growing up. And I have to say that I heard all the time those voices, the support from my family saying, yes, you can do it. So I decided to take the risk of, okay, let's explore going to the US for an MBA. And I came here in 2002. I attended Dartmouth and with my husband. And it's been a journey of, and we'll talk a little bit about this later, but it's been a journey of hard work. It's been a journey of coming to a different culture of building trust. Because when I showed up and I finished my, my MBA, the question that I could see people had in mind was, can she do the work? Can she communicate? Can she adjust to this new culture? She's been here for two years. So it's been a, a journey of building trust, and most important, building trust in myself. Building trust in myself and building trust in others. So I've been working in corporate America for more than 20 years. And 10 years ago, when I had my first daughter, I decided to open my own business. And I did that because with family not living with us, it was very important for me to have the flexibility to raise a family. That was my decision back then. And it's been another journey uh, of entrepreneurship, hard work, and building trust again. And right now, at this point in my life, it's the time to give back. I'm very involved with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Director of Entrepreneurship. And I'm giving back to the community by helping others find their path, their way, and their passion. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank Christine? Probably. <laughs> um, so I'm Christine Cox West, partner of the Fortis Agency. Um, I actually well, I did not have as hard of a path as that, so God bless you. <laughs> um, I was lucky enough to grow up in New Jersey. I went to the College of New Jersey, and I went to school for accounting. Um, turns out I hated accounting. I was really good at math, hated accounting. And my, um, my dad had told me I would be good at that, so I listened to him. But it turned out I was very good at tax accounting. It was something that I loved. Um, and I said, how do I take my love of math and tax accounting and help people be in front of the actual client? And so I came into the financial planning world um, at 21 years old. Uh, female, there's about 17% of financial advisors are female, so we're definitely the minority. All of my managers are male. Um, I was told to cold call and um, say things over the phone that no women should be saying. It's really weird and awkward. And um, I think that's one of the things that I want to give back to my industry is helping other females um, in a way that they can appropriately and um, use their skills and talents that a lot of men don't have in helping other people, families, other women, other women business owners make good financial decisions. Um, so 
two years ago, I decided to change a lot of the things that I didn't like in the financial industry. And there's trends going towards more of a fiduciary role where you have to act in the best interest of the client. And I wanted to do that. So we formed um, a business. I have two three partners and about a dozen advisors and a few hundred brokers that use us for unique strategies and, and uh, insurance products. So that's a, I guess, holistic view of the firm and a very abridged version of how I got there. Excellent, thank you. Janetta? Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Vanetta Hawkins um, with Wells Fargo. I have been, uh, my journey, I've been in banking for 28 years uh, this past June. Um, it's been a long but fun journey. Uh, one thing I think I learned early, or early on with my journey is if you don't plan to succeed, you plan to fail. And for me, failure was never an option. Um, I was a young mom at 18, so uh, working was, uh, it, it was all it was going to be, and failure was just never um, something that was uh, within my path. Um, but just around the su planning to succeed, my thing is, um, with my journey, is I always made sure I wanted to know where was my path going, what did my career look like, and what does success mean to me. Um, and that was very important, um, you know, coming through um, in the banking space. Um, so for me, I, you know, I think back to, I remember I had, I was in a sales position for a long time. Within that 28 years, most of my uh, tenure has been in management. But I remember I was in a sales position making a, a fabulous salary. But from a career perspective, I wanted more and I wanted to be, uh, I wanted some additional challenges. And I remember um, applying for a job that was literally about two hours one way um, from my house. Um, and ultimately, it would have paid the same salary in which I was making. But for me, that was what success meant for me, and that was what I needed to do to be more challenged within my career. So understanding um, you know, where you're looking to go and making sure that you're always moving in that direction and that you have a clear path of uh, what your journey is going to be and that you're happy along the way. Uh, the great thing I would say about my career out of 28 years, I've always been able to be happy. <laughs> I mean, I'm a happy person to start with, but <laughs> in my job, I've always made sure that I, 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 um, I positioned myself in something that made me happy, right? So um, taking that journey and making sure that I, I was within that road and I wanted to continue to grow within my career, but then also on the flip side from a management perspective, making sure that we understand where our employees want to go, what makes them happy. Uh, I remember I took over uh, a management position and I had 20, uh, 21 employees. And when I walked in the door, I said, okay, I sat down with everybody and said, where are you and where do you want to go, right? Um, out of those 21 employees, 19 people wanted to go somewhere else, wanted to move up within their career. And then the two, and two people said, no, I'm happy where I'm at, Vanetta. I'm, this is, I want to be here forever. And I'm like, fabulous. We will keep you there forever. <laughs> but out of, those, out of two years within that role, every single one of those 19 people were able to elevate within their, within, um, within their path, within their self because I sat down with them and I made sure and I understood where did they want to go. And as a woman, we have to make sure, I think when you, um, when, you, when you bring in diverse people, when you hire leadership from a diverse or female perspective, they're going to hire diverse and women uh, employees. So we're able to always, not just, I, I remember seeing someone had posted on their LinkedIn before, as they climb up the ladder, they look back and they pull more people up with them. So for me, that's kind of been my journey um, within my 28 years is I'm always looking to see how can I help you advance because it, it takes nothing away from me to, to, to help people to continue to grow within their career. Thank you. Thank you, Vanetta. Thank you. Well, it is so good to be here this morning, and I really have to commend Angela and the rest of the team for um, this panel. Oftentimes, uh, speaking about women and doing women's events is terrific, it's fabulous. I have four sons and a husband, so I'm in a male world <laughs> all the time. <laughs> so being with women is great. And what I love is that we see a diversity of women here. 
which is very, very important as well. Um, oftentimes when I see uh, things about women's initiatives and events, they don't necessarily look as diverse as this room does, so congratulations on that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess one message for my path is that I never expected to be where I am. Um, I run an organization, a not-for-profit, that I co-founded with my father called the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership. And I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to run a nonprofit that supports entrepreneurs. And so, you know, I want um, you to know that it is actually okay to not necessarily know what you want to do. Um, everyone doesn't have to have a defined path from the time that you're in sixth grade. <laughs> it just doesn't happen for everyone. But what is really important is to create options for yourself. So getting the best education that you can possibly get, um, making connections, meeting people, uh, developing relationships, those are all things that are really, really important. And from each experience that you have, making sure that you're taking something away that you can use for the next experience. So um, <coughs> I started my career uh, in the financial analyst program at Goldman Sachs out of college, and I went to Harvard undergrad, uh, have a degree in economics, and people said, well, how did you get to Goldman? Is that wh what you always want? I said, well, no, actually, it's just kind of what people did. Um, my peers, I didn't even know what I wanted to do. I was always a focused person in, um, in, in high school. I did my work. I did what I was supposed to do. I think I was just afraid that I would get in trouble if I didn't, so <laughs> I just did my work. Um, and uh, I landed at, at, at Harvard, and uh, even that wasn't a real conscious decision. I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to go to Harvard. I applied to 10 colleges because I had no idea where I wanted to go. Um, and then just kind of picked. And that's really how it happened. Um, economics, I couldn't think of anything else to study. So a lot of things sort of happened by just falling into it. Um, again, it wasn't planned. Um, doing a program when I was in college, because again, a lot of other people who were economics majors, that's what they did. And so it led me to a path at Goldman. Now Goldman was my only job outside of working for my parents. Um, my parents had a newspaper publishing business. Uh, it was what they did full time. It was in Plainfield, which is where I grew up. Um, it was called Plainfield Today, and then it was called City News. And even they did the newspaper because they saw that there was a need. It wasn't that all their lives they had wanted to have a business or something like that. It was they saw a need, they pursued that. And so I was exposed to entrepreneurship, small business ownership from a very young age. Like I said, that's all we did. That's all I knew. I thought that everyone went to school and then, you know, played their sports and then worked, uh, you know, throughout the night to get a newspaper out or to do whatever product they had to do. That was our life. My brother, my sister, and I all worked in the business. When I went to Goldman Sachs, I was in the mergers and acquisitions uh, area. Uh, so I saw companies, people that had started businesses and sold businesses for a lot of money. I mean, almost an, an unfathomable amount of money, right? Unfortunately, none of them look like most of us in this room. And it just always struck me, why is it that certain people are able to do that, but minority business owners, women business owners, are not really pursuing that path and are not able to extract the value um, from their business in that same way. So fast forward, I was taking some time off when we were, uh, were having our first son. Um, I was writing business plans during the dot-com era and that kind of took me off of the path of working with my parents. Um, I decided to, my father and I worked together to start this organization because we saw that the people who often are those able to extract the value from their businesses and sell their businesses for a lot of money, they have a certain mindset that has been developed in them, ingrained in them for a very long time. And often it's because they think they can. And women and minority-owned businesses are, n uh, and, and sometimes it's, it's actually um, unconscious. It is 
um, that uh, you're focusing on the kids and the flexibility that your business affords. And you're focusing on smaller opportunities because those are the things that are afforded to women and minority businesses and, and particular opportunities that are set aside, so to speak. And so unfortunately, our mindset stays kind of here with where we can go with our business. And so I think that, um, you know, for me, the work that I do right now is so important. Last year, or earlier this year, actually, we launched an initiative called uh, Women of Color Connecting uh, to especially support women of color entrepreneurs um, in getting on the growth scale exit trajectory. And so the message that I have for many of you, how many people are entrepreneurs in the room? Okay, a good number. Aspiring entrepreneurs? Anyone else? Okay, a few. Um, you know, the, the whole, and you, those of you who are in career path, you never know when that, when that path may lead you into an entrepreneurial journey. And I always believe that it's necessary to have an entrepreneurial mindset, even if you're within a career. Um, but the thing that I have to, to, to really, that I want to leave you with is thinking about how you're extracting the value of what you're doing. You're working so hard as an entrepreneur. You're working day and night harder than you probably would even in a job. And when you decide that you no longer want to do that and you want to move on to something else, or for whatever reason you're not able to any longer run your business, are you just leaving it on the table, letting it die and expire, or are you extracting the value so that you can use that and take all that you have built up in that business and um, using that to generate wealth for yourself, for your family, um, and moving on to the next thing. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Jill. Okay, Kate. <laughs> oh my, I feel so boring compared to everybody <laughs> else that has spoken before me. And there's been little pieces of everything that everyone has said so far that is so true. It's like, oh, I relate to that, I relate to that. <laughs> my, my journey was not clear. It really was not a clear path. I graduated from college and I was a kindergarten teacher. I loved it. I really loved it. I loved working with young children. I loved their minds. I loved their honesty. And um, I, I had some changes in my personal life where I found myself a single parent after a while. And I was teaching kindergarten at Catholic school. So I was not going to make ends meet that way. So what I did was um, I found myself in banking. And I was in banking for 22 years. And I was in one bank that had four names, but that's a whole other <laughs> story. <laughs> and you know, one of the things that was great about being in banking back then is um, it was very much relationship-based, very much relationship, because the banks used to feel that if you developed a relationship, the sales and the products, they were going to come. Um, but then that started to change. And I am not a true salesperson. I'm not going to go in and try to get you to buy the product of the day or the product of the week. Uh, I really felt that I was working on relationships. And that's just me as a person. And so I went, I traveled a whole bunch of different routes through banking. And um, I was kind of tapped on the shoulder with one bank. And they said, we'd like you to focus on women in finance. And I, I, really, I really got that. I said, that's so great because at that particular point in time, it was the men who were controlling the finances and the family. And the women were afraid to even use the word. Um, so we really did focus on women. And you could imagine that that was relationship-based also. You know, it was getting that comfort level with somebody to get them to open up about their finances. And we used to do large events just on the importance of women getting to um, be comfortable. And I remember we had this very large event, and I had asked my mother to come with one of her friends. And she had <coughs> come, and you know, we were talking about the importance of women knowing how important it was. And I think it was probably eight months later, my father died suddenly. And I had said to my mother, what did you think? And she was like, oh, it was very nice, Kathleen. It was a great job. But then she found herself in that situation. And it was very eye-opening for her. And she saw the value 
of what was happening. Um, so what, what happened then is another bank bought and they, I was tapped on the shoulder to work with women and entrepreneurship. And this is that defining moment where you never think about entrepreneurship. I really had, and I was a banker. And um, we started to work with women in business. How did they get there? What are the struggles that they're facing? And they faced a lot of struggles compared to men. And, you know, it was working with them to make, you know, their voices heard, you know, talk about networking, um, just really help them to not give up. This is what we did. So we, we helped them try to get financing. Um, when women would come in and they were asking for a loan, we would start to talk about a business plan. And I could see their eyes just glaze over. And I realized they didn't know what, it, what a business plan was. So I had to find a place that would help them with business plans because it, when you're in a bank or a financial institution, you don't have the time to do that. And I found the small business development centers. And I really got very interested in what they were doing and the, the value that they served and the hand-holding that they did. And um, I, I really thought, gee, this is a place with my education background um, is now rolling into a career path um, that wasn't clearly defined. And I've been working at William Patterson now for over 15 years. We work with people who want to start a business. We work with people who are in business, who are looking to expand, to sell their businesses. Um, so it has been a journey, but everything has snowballed off of everything that has been um, in my path, in the past. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Karen? Good morning. <laughs> How is everybody feeling? Good? Okay, um, well, my journey was a very long, very um, hard one. I am a mother of four children, a single mom, and I have a grandson. And um, my parents came to this country because, of course, like everybody else, they want a better life. And... Um, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, they came here with nothing, but they worked very, very hard. Had two jobs. Um, I hardly saw them when I was little, um, but education was always instilled in us. They always made sure that, you know, they didn't finish school. My mom never finished um, grammar school, nothing. She, um, and my father either. He didn't finish college. But they always were you know, reading the newspaper, they're always trying to learn the language. Um, to this day, it's very hard for them to learn, um, to understand them the English language. So I grew up, um, you know, just going through my education pretty much on my own with my older sister. And um, so as a, at a young age, you know, since they worked really hard, um, at now they have um, about 10 apartment buildings. Um, we, um, I helped manage that, and, you know, since I was a little kid, I was always taught, um, you know, how to manage my finances and how to help them out in the business, you know, after every time after school, that's all I would do, that's all I would know, and, you know, that would always interest me, but, um, when I started after high school, I got a, a scholarship for to go to FDU, Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, I went for a year, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for me at that moment. It was very hard um, to get adjusted because it was a big school for me. I'm the type of person I like smaller schools. Um, and I just felt like I didn't fit in there. Um, I dropped out and um, I met my husband at the time. I got married, um, had my daughter. But then I felt like I had a void. I felt like something was missing. I wanted to finish my education. I went back in uh, 2001, pretty much, and um, I, I redid my research. I checked online to see, you know, what what school would be close to where I lived, and you know, all, all these little things that that um, you know uh, that was that had my um, major that I wanted to do. 
at that point, I really, you know, was uh, was towards it. Uh, I wanted to help out with the business, so I wanted to learn more. So um, I went back to school. Berkeley, I could speak very highly of Berkeley because it, it the minute I came through the doors, it was very um, welcoming. Everybody um, was helping me through what, uh, I was a non-traditional student, so I, they helped me through my journey of my education. I got my associates in uh, 2001 in business management, and then I got my, I went back to get my bachelor's um, in accounting. So, um, and then I didn't stop there. I got my master's at uh, Caldwell University, so I got my business in my MBA. So. Um, but through through all that journey it was very very hard. You know, I had a lot of setbacks, a lot of struggles, a lot of, you know, I have um, my grandson who's hearing impaired. I have my um, my youngest son who's you know had to go through a lot of therapies. My oldest who had like two strokes in the middle that I was um, going through school, so she might you know be going through you know they said she might have MS. So it was very, very hard. A lot of times that I wanted to, you know, give up, and but I didn't. You know, I kept on. I kept on, and um, now, you know, it, it was I in 2014 is when I started um, my nonprofit, mm -hmm. and the reason that I did that was because um, it was a long um, since I was a kid. I'm a domestic violence survivor, and that. Um, you know, I went through, through my childhood, um, I saw a lot of abuse. And then when I got married, the same thing. Uh, I went through 18 years of uh, domestic violence abuse, um, physically, mentally, in every type of way that you can think of. And it was very hard for me through, through go, to go through all that. And I went through therapy two years, my kids went through therapy two years, and I said, okay, now, you know, at the end of the two years, I told my story. And I felt like I wanted to help other women like me. And um, so I started the nonprofit. It helps out underprivileged families and domestic violence victims. So we help with services little by little. We just started, you know, it was just me and my kids. You know, one day I just said, instead of, you know, having our normal Thanksgiving dinner, let's go out, help the community. And my kids loved that. I instilled that in that in them, and they loved it. You know, you know, they we got blankets, we got food, and you know, they said, "Okay, we want to do more." I said, "Okay." So Christmas time came. Um, we I set up a dinner, and you know, I always believe in God that it always um, is always. You know, you always have to believe, have faith, because I, you know, I didn't have any money. People ask me, you know, how did you do it? You probably had a lot of money, but no, I didn't have anything. You know, but a lot of people, you know, when I mentioned it, a lot of people came to me and said, well, do you need help? I can bring a tray. I can do this. And we all came together, and we made, we helped 250 um, people. It was between a mother and um, And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was, it, it, that first year was very, very beautiful because um, not only did we, give them toys and and food and clothing and everything but we also you know all the kids held hands all the mothers held hands and we said a prayer together and it, it was it was very very beautiful so after that I said you know I became a 501c3 you know it grew a lot of people saw that and you know I, and little by little I got more and more help and now we help about like maybe 400 500 people and um you know, we do also a 5K in um, Patterson. You know, we do different events throughout the year. So it, it, it's, it was something that's very passionate to me. And, you know, never in my dreams did I think that I would have a nonprofit. Um, but that's one of my things that I, I love to do. Also, I have my, um, my little small firm of Pena Tax Services, which I do taxes and payroll. And, you know, I, I felt like Berkeley had helped me with the foundation that I needed of, of what um, to do, you know, my nonprofit and to have my um, my small business. 
and it helped me with my family's um, business also because I do their accounting, I do their payroll, you know, notary, everything. And, you know, uh, going through all that, you know, it, it inspired my children to, you know, my daughter is, is the president of uh, the Our Way to Hope and her friends. And, you know, I, I, I always tell them, you know, tell your friends, tell, you know, anybody that you think would want to be in, and it's, it's growing, little by little it's growing. So, you know, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing your story. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears, and uh, Valeria, I'd like to ask you um, a question. You had talked a little bit about your journey already to the United States from Argentina. So a recent study by the Nonpartisan Fiscal Policy Institute's Immigration Research Center reveals that immigrants make up 13% of the U.S. population in general, and 18% of small business, uh, business owners. Can you briefly, because I know we're going to run out of time, and I really want to get through everyone um, at least one more time. Can you briefly talk about the growing influence of Hispanic-owned businesses and how the statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Hispanic Entrepreneurship Training Program are programs are working with these businesses, particularly Latina women-owned businesses? Excellent, yes. Thank you. So while immigrants um, own 20 percent, 20 something percent of businesses are, you know, when you look at down, downtown Main Street America, 50 percent of businesses are owned by immigrants. So immigrants are a major force in this country, and if one of those five Main Street businesses employ one person, we will be at full employment. So that's the power of immigrants in this country. Uh, particularly, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce offers an entrepreneurship program that's been offered for six years in a row. It's a program built from successful business owners to entrepreneurs, uh, mostly women, I have to say, run the program, all of them immigrants. And we have people coming from 11 countries. 70% of those students are foreign born. And the power of the program is we help them be comfortable with the unknown. As we said before, not of all of us, I think none of us really know what's going to happen in 10 years, our path, we find our path as we go and we listen to that inner voice that tells us where to go, right? So we help them be uncomfortable with that, being comfortable with the uncomfortable with the unknown, and we help them figure out their path through building business plans, through supporting them in hiring people, in getting loans, and this makes a big difference. This program really helps them progress, and the beauty of that program is we see their life improve for them and their families, their household income increases, they have access to a better life, them and their families. So this program is going to be offered in 2020 for the sixth year. If you are a business no owner, please see me at the end and we can talk a little bit more. But the goal of this program is to help Hispanics and beyond, Hispanics and beyond really make a different difference in their lives. And um, Excellent, really thank you so much, I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, Christine. You were named New Jersey Biz 2019 Top 40 Under 40 at the age of 29. Congratulations. You. <laughs> You've already mentioned a little bit how you became the partner um, in an insurance agency at such a young age. And early in your career, you were made an offer that would have doubled your salary. Instead, you walked away and started your own business. What was the superpower that gave you the courage to do that? So uh, I think there's a, a theme in here because a lot of us have kids. And I'll step back a little bit in, in my history. So um, I got into the business at 21. And at 23, I got pregnant um, with my now, now husband. Um, and I remember he was so excited when I told, told him. I was like breaking the news to him, not like telling him. <laughs> and um, I didn't expect that reaction, to be honest. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. I'm so afraid. And I called my best friend and she said, why are you, why are you afraid? And I was like, well, what will people think? And I grew up in a community where, you know, that wasn't necessarily common. 
if anyone asked if that would happen to Christine Cox, that was definitely not gonna, not on the radar as being a young mom. And um, she said, well, if you and Dave lived in, in a cave, would you do it? And I was like, of course, I love him. Like, I wanna get married to him someday. And she was like, then why do you care what people think, right? So I did it and I was so afraid. And once I like got over the fact that, you know, I was worrying about what other people was thinking, it was the best decision of my life. And not only personally, but also professionally. Um, it's hard when you're 21 and you're giving financial advice to people and you're a female. I think they automatically doubt that you know what you're talking about regardless of your education and your background. And to be able to relate with people that were 15, 20 years older than me and explaining this is what I'm doing for my child. This is how I'm planning for their college. This is how I'm purchasing life insurance in case something happened to me or my child's father or um, if my income, something happens to my income because I become sick or hurt, I need that to be replaced for my family. Just to have that perspective, it was a game changer for me. And so that was taking something that I was so afraid of and turning it into one of the most ex uh, amazing experiences, both personally and professionally. And to this day, I mean, now it's out there how old I am, but, <laughs> most, <laughs> but most people that I'm friends with, that I network with, usually think I'm in my 40s. Um, my husband looks a little older. I've, I've been in the business for eight, nine years now. And um, these are people that were at the same life stages together. So I, I think that was something that really helped propel my career. And so I, I always say like to people, if, if there, it seems like a challenge, you can turn that challenge right around and make it an opportunity, regardless of what it is, whether you're a young mom, like many of us were, or um, something tragic happens. There's a way to turn it around and make it a positive. And the most important thing for me was surrounding myself with a community of people. I had support. And when I first had my daughter, I was driving all over the state of New Jersey, seeing who could watch her, dropping her off here or there. Um, I, we're very fortunate. We have in-home care now, um, somebody that lives with us and takes care of our children. And, and that was one of the things that, you know, probably before we could afford to do so, we did it because that was what it was going to take for us to grow our business and, and become more successful. And I use that in my own practice now. The second I can afford to hire somebody else to do something else, I'm gonna do it because that gives me the ability to go out and, and do what I'm really good at and not do the things that I shouldn't be doing. And, um, but going back to the community around me, it's the women around me that, that I think have made me successful and um, have promoted me in, in things like that, like NJ Biz or whatever it is. They, if you get a good community around you, you can raise each other up together and the power in numbers is amazing. I'm very involved in the Women in Business program with the Morris County Chamber of Commerce. That's where I met Angela. And, and the feeling in the room where it's, it's not a, you know, let's, let's hate on the men club. It's how can we raise each other up and listen to other inspirational women. And I think that's what today is about. There's men in the room. And that's, that's an amazing thing to see that it's not, you know, why, are, why, are, why are, should we be stronger than them or whatever. It's how can we work together. And I, I spoke to some TCNJ um, students this week and I explained that it's all about helping each other. If you see something that's wrong, you say something. And um, men should be supporting women just as much as women should be supporting women and women should also be supporting men. It's not one or the other, it's we're all together. And that's really how I've, I've grown my business and was able to make a jump into business on my own because I knew that regardless of um, what happened, I had a, a network and a, a community around me that would support my business. And without it, I would have never been able to make that, that jump on my own. Excellent, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Vanetta, you cover most of the Northeast region from New Jersey to Maine, the largest territory in the Wells Fargo Corporation. You are responsible for 600 loan officers. We just heard about the broken rung in corporate America, and you talked a little, about, a little bit about this already, but if you could share about what it takes to move up the corporate ladder into a management position. Um, so um, one of, the, I think on my the slide that was up there, um, I live by a quote, uh, Whitney M. Young, um, it's better to be prepared for an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. 
So for me, I'm always about every day I live to say, how can I be a better Veneta? That's it. Like, I compete against no one. You know, you think about, you know, Beyonce, there's a meme with Beyonce, and she's stepping into the room. You know, I'm Beyonce in my head every day. Like, I'm stepping <laughs> into the room. Uh, <laughs> yes. I'm stepping into the room because I am a better Veneta today than I was yesterday. So I don't even care what's going on, who's there, who's, everybody's fabulous, beautiful, and all that good jazz. I am a better Veneta today than I was yesterday, so I'm Beyonce all day stepping into the room. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, um, so, you know, I really say, uh, you know, compete against no one. And when you're thinking about st coming up the ladder is you don't let someone else um, value you. Uh, you know, understand your own value. Uh, I remember when I was interviewing um, with Angela and I remember a position that I was going to apply for. And when I would mention this to a select few of people, because you don't want to tell everybody what you're doing, right? Um, a select few of people, and they said, oh, no, you shouldn't be applying for that. You should apply for the position below. And I was like, thank you for your opinion. <laughs> appreciate it. But, you know, you know, and I thought about that, and I'm like, what's wrong with these people? And I said, they clearly don't know me. They don't know my value. So what I'm not going to do is allow their opinion to dictate what I do. And I went ahead, you know, and I applied for the job. Um, I applied for the job, killed the, the initial interview, killed the panel. Uh, unfortunately, the job was eliminated like two, 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 30 days later. <laughs> Glad I didn't get it. I would have been out of a job. Um, but I made it through, and I had conversations with the um, panel, um, the, the people that did the, ran the panel, and they said I had a really wonderful interview, and I would have been one of the top people that probably was selected. But here I am going through these motions and having people tell me, no, I shouldn't apply for that, and looking at me like I was crazy, like when I really told them I was going for the job. So, you know, know your own worth, know your value, and don't let anybody ever dictate to you, you, know, what, you can, what you can do <laughs> or who you are. You know, know, know yourself, know your worth, and you'll be able to move up that ladder because you always know who you are. Um, you know, I think with that first go around with questions, I'm a very high energy, positive person. And sometimes, that, you know, that's a negative to people. They don't, you know, there's too much Veneta for them. <laughs> so, you know, I get it. I get it. I get it. And, and I recognize that I might not get hired by a person because of my positivity, because of my energy. And you know what? Just wasn't meant for me to, to work with them. Right? So um, know, know your value. Excellent. Thank you, Vanetta. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> I'm going to have to come up with a theme song or something just to get that Vanetta swag going. <laughs> All right, Jill. So if you could just um, talk a little bit about how the Institute um, has been elevating entrepreneurship in the cities like Newark. Also, I'm going to give you some loaded, loaded questions here because I really <laughs> don't want to miss a couple of them. But some of our students are actually interning and working um, for the Institute of Entrepreneurial Leadership and supporting the South Ward Initiative in the city of Newark. And if you could just talk a little bit about um, the Institute work in the city of Newark and how entrepreneurs can tap into that talent and then also, if you can, include a way that allows um, entrepreneurs to grow a business in a way that it attains wealth. Wow. I know that's sure. a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me, let me try to say that in a little bit of time. <laughs> Um, so, you know, first I'll address the, the students, um, and it started with relationships. Met Angela at an event, was introduced to a mutual friend. We got to talking, um, went in and um, met some of the rest of the team members, 
Um, they referred some students who were both terrific, and I have to say that it was really a, a positive that they had had. Uh, they were both entrepreneurs themselves, had experience, so it wasn't trying to bring people in who, and teaching them even how to work and a work ethic or anything like that. Like they came in prepared and ready and doing things. And my social media now is starting to take off a little bit more and the whole Instagram thing, which I was not <laughs> part of that world. <laughs> and it is because of uh, the woman who is interning who has gotten the Instagram going. And we got our program um, it's a called Success Circles uh, which focuses on, again, women of color entrepreneurs, which, by the way, is funded by Wells Fargo. Uh, <laughs> and, and the grant from Wells Fargo was actually what enabled me to uh, hire. She was interning, and I was able to hire Melissa to uh, run that program, to be a, the program coordinator for that program. So we're hoping to increase that so we can bring her on full time, by the way. Um, but you know we're we're really excited about that. So the re the relationship has been great. And we just um, I'm interviewing another intern from Berkeley tomorrow, as a matter of fact. So it has been a terrific relationship. The students are amazing, and it's really helping us to take the Institute for Entrepreneurial Leadership to another level. So with respect to working with businesses, I have to clarify: we work with businesses that are located all over, and probably about 50% of our businesses are even in New York City and there are things that we are doing on a national basis. But um, in places like Newark, again, it's helping entrepreneurs to see what's possible. Oftentimes, the thinking is very limited because there's just not the knowledge and understanding. They do and follow what they have seen and what they know. And so there's a limitation if you just don't know what you can do, what's possible. And so we steer people to various resources because our focus is um, pretty narrow, and we want to uh, identify businesses that have the potential to grow, scale, and exit, even if that exit is not, you know, Facebook-type or Uber-type money, but where someone might be able to take that business and sell it for a couple hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. It's amazing. People buy and sell dry cleaners, landscaping businesses, all sorts of businesses all the time. This doesn't occur to many people. We just don't know about that world. When my parents had their business, they just didn't understand the process of what they would really have to do in order to sell the business until it was really too late. And they hadn't built the business in a way that enabled them, as I mentioned before, to extract that value. So really what we're trying to do with uh, the work that, that we uh, do is to help to um, uh, open doors, open uh, opportunity and access, despite the fact that these entrepreneurs don't have a lot of resources. So, and, and many people think that that is really uh, the constraint, not having money. When it's a challenge, yes, not having money, as you well know, but often it's not having relationships that is the bigger factor. And when you have relationships and people who are willing to help you to give advice, to open a door, to make an introduction for you, that can be so much more valuable and helps to take your business um, to another level and put you on a different path. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. thank you. Excellent, thank you. Kate, um, so the New Jersey Small Business Development Centers are at the forefront of providing free resources to grow small businesses in New Jersey. What are some of the common mistakes women-owned businesses make? And can you talk about how diversity of businesses in the city of Patterson and how the Small Business Development Center supports such a diverse group of businesses? Uh, resilience. We have to be very flexible when trying to meet um, the needs of all the uh, diversity that's in the city of Patterson. I don't, can you hear me? Okay. Um, when I started working with the Women Entrepreneurs Connection in banking, that's when I realized the challenges that women face. Women would come in to us um, in addition to not having a plan, but they would say, I think I need a loan. How much do you think I can get? That's, that's not 
what you need to do. Would a, man, a man would come in, he'd say, I need $125,000. This is how I'm going to spend it. This is the material I need. And there was such confidence. There was such confidence in them coming in and asking for a loan. Women did not have the confidence because they're unsure. And then you have to get them to say, okay, if I ask for $100,000, you can't come back in three months and say, I need another 10. You're not going to get it. So I think women coming into us have kind of, they haven't passed it yet, I will be honest. They have not passed that, uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry. The wall, the block in, in front of them by saying that. They still are unsure that they are going to get that money, even if they have a perfect plan. So we have to work with them to get them to understand that what they're doing is of value. Entrepreneurship, you're not going to succeed if you're not passionate about what you're going into. And when you can come in to somebody who's trying to help you any kind of resource, you know, whether it's helping them with marketing plans or business plans or helping them to get financing, you know, introducing them to bankers. I think one of the things you've heard, relationships, it's really all about relationships. Um, that has to continue, but they, we need to build up the confidence of the women in, in um, getting the funding that they need. As far as the diversity, I mean, Patterson, our main office is in Patterson, and there's 52 different nationalities that are in Patterson. Um, we, we have to adjust to the community. We work with uh, the Peruvian Chamber of Commerce. We do programs there. We have bilingual um, consultants. We have to speak the language. We have to be visible in the community. If I sit in my office, pe we don't get out, nobody sees us, nobody realizes that you are a resource. So being visible is clearly important um, in a city like Patterson, as it would be in Newark. You know, you have to be out there and fit into the diversity. Um, I work a lot in the Jamaican community with some nonprofits. And it, you just have to fit in. You just have to make yourself one of the community. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Karen, you're a graduate of Berkeley College. I'm also going to uh, share some Berkeley pride. You were also named Alumni of the Year in 2019. As you shared, the path to earning a college degree and starting a business hasn't been easy. You earned an associate's degree and a bachelor's degree. You are Peruvian American and the first in your family to graduate from college and to earn a master's degree. What advice do you have for students, especially first generation students, about setting the pace for success? Okay, well, my advice is that um, if at the beginning you do not know what your path is, just start it out. Because the first two years is usually your general courses. So on the way that you um, are going through the classes, you can find what is what you're passionate about, what you like. So that's what I always tell m my experience with my daughter. She was the same way. She didn't know what path to go. And I said, just go, you know, don't, don't stop. Because she wanted to stop. And I said, no, um, you know, in that path, you're going to find, and also to find a mentor, some, a counselor, somebody that can, um, you know, help you with what you want to do. I said, find something that, you know, you're good at and that you're passionate about. So, um, you know, it sometimes, you know, uh, on, th on the way you're going you're gonna to see what you, what you like. And that's what, you know, happened to me. You know, I, I went to Berkeley. Well, first, when I started, you know, like I said, um, fairly, I didn't know what I wanted. But on the way, when um, I went back, you know, I, I like business and I like um, getting into the, uh, the accounting. So 
you know, you know, don't give up. There's, there's always going to be somebody that's going to, um, you know, tell you that you can't do something. You know, I had a lot of negativity in my life that, you know, they saw me and they said, oh, you know, you can't do that. Or, you know, why are you trying to, you know, get to that position? You know, and it, it was very hard to try to get a, a, a manager position or, you know, even right now I'm on the board of ed. You know, I'm the first, you know, Hispanic in Emerald Park and uh, to be elected. You know, nobody, you know, that I had kept as a, as a secret, you know, I didn't, nobody knew, you know, I didn't have any, um, any um, campaign money or anything like that. But, you know, I love children, I love education, and that's what I, you know, that's what I'm there for, so. Excellent, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Angela, um, are there any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask? Hi, my name is Kimon James. I'm the founder for The Amazing Help, which is a nonprofit organization as well. This question is for Jill and Karen. Um, also a mother for five children. My oldest is autistic. What has been your significant barrier and how did you overcome those barriers? Uh, and are you asking that related to raising a family, kids? Oh, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> um, so probably um, the most significant barrier has been things in my own head. Interfering with what I think that I can do or putting up barriers. And, and don't get me wrong, there, there are things that have come up that have been challenging. It is not easy having children, uh, period. And I was, you know, <laughs> and I mean, I'm fortunate enough, my, you know, my husband's super involved, he's a great dad, all that kind of stuff. But he traveled a lot. And I always say, you know, dads get the luxury of deciding when they're going to be a dad and what kind of dad they're going to be. Moms, we're moms all the time. It doesn't matter. You're sick, you're deathbed, you know, you got to <laughs> get those kids to school, get them out or do whatever. And so, you know, I think um, for me it has been um, uh, figuring out that I should be the best me. And um, getting over whatever I thought our barrier saying is not a barrier. You just have to keep moving beyond that. And um, for me, it, you know, unfortunately, it took a little time to figure all that out. Um, now I am in my fabulousness who I am, <laughs> and it is what it is. And I'm willing to say what needs to be said um, because, again, it is what it is. And I have lived enough life to have an opinion uh, and to have seen what is what the reality is out there and to share that with other people so I'm very clear now that whatever I thought in the past were the barriers that I had were really things that were in my own head that I needed to figure out how to get beyond myself and just do what needed to be done great thank you well, um, being a mo single mom with four children, is it was very hard um, trying to get the nonprofit going. There was many barriers, many um, struggles. But um, like you said, it's it's in your head. You know, you you think that you can't do something, but then comes uh, you know your support system. You know, my support system was my mother. You know, you know somebody that didn't have. Um, that education, but she always gave me, you know, her advice, you know, to just keep moving forward. Don't let those setbacks, those those struggles, keep you from doing what you want to do. You know, what's in your heart, um, what you love the most. You know, you know, as a simple thing of just making your bed in the morning. You know, that's an accomplishment. You know, <laughs> I always use that. You know, any all the little things that she would say. You know. You know, manage your time. You know, I, I have four kids. You know, they they're, they're going through their different um, things um, in school. But you know, we have 24 hours in a day. I wake up very early, five o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. I'm always thinking of what my day is gonna be. You know, I schedule myself. I make time for myself first. You know, I exercise. You know, you have to check those stresses out. You know, um, and then you know, I I take care of my children. 
you know, I'm there for my children. I'm an advocate for the children, you know, when they're going to school, you know, being involved in, in any activity. I'm the class mom. You know, I'm all over the place, you know, because I, I love that. I have that drive, and I push myself, and I say sometimes, you know, I, I feel down, or and I say, you know what, you know, you know, I, I believe so much in God. You know, there's always there to help me. I say my little prayer, at uh, you know, in the morning, you know, and, and every little thing that I do, it helps me throughout the day. So, you know, I don't let those barriers get to me. Now I feel like I'm a stronger woman for everything that I went through. You know, I you know, I think that every every struggle that you go, it's a lesson learned, you know, that it teaches you something, teaches you to to be a better person. So like she said, it's a better me now. I, I feel stronger, I feel confident, more confident now. And I, I, you know, I'm glad that I can come and talk and tell my story and help other women, inspire other women, empower other women. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> one more, one more question. And Oh, thank you. I'm Councilwoman Ruby Cotton from the city of Patterson. Um, I'm sorry that I'm late, but I just wanted to make sure I got here, my good friend Terry. But what I find is that we as women sometimes have to um, be kinder to each other. Because once we understand, I think that, and, and, and who you surround yourself with, because I find that no matter what um, your job is, or, or you know, people may look at you differently because you don't have a college degree, or if you do have a college degree. But if I find that if we be more kinder and nicer to each other, and say, you know what, it's okay that you're a factory worker. It's okay that you're a dishwasher. It's okay that you're a waitress. And we have to let women feel that they are important. And that's going to take us as women to say, you know what, come on in with me. I want to show you everything. This way, you can have a better self-esteem about yourself and then you can do once you have a better self-esteem then you can do more because you know what doors are always slammed on us so one of these days some of them doors are going to open and that's how i feel look at it that we have to put that positive positive in each and every one that something something good is going to come out of everything that we do so i just needed to to say how i feel be, because the doors were shut on me being involved with schools you know, canceling meetings, they wouldn't call me, they wouldn't tell me, and people would say, well, how you still come? Because that's what they want. They don't want you to come. So you have to say, I'm still coming no matter what they do, I'm still coming. So I just needed to say that today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, before can I, I share, can I share one really, really quick thing? This is Jill. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Really, like, really, wait, really, where, really, really quick. And this is because I know that this mom <laughs> thing is on so many people's minds, and it is tough. Um, just one really quick thing is that no matter what you do, you are um, a great mom, and you're doing what you're doing out of love and your need to make a better life for yourself and for your kids. And that no matter what you think, you know, I'm not being there for my child, I can't be at every game, I can't be at every school function, whatever, your kids will be okay. There are people who completely neglect their children and the children grow up okay. Your kids will be okay. So if we can just take a little of that weight off of our minds so that you can do what you need to do, it will help ease the stress for so many people. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you so much, Jill. That's very important, absolutely. Um, I'd like to just read a quick quote, and then um, I think we're going to do a group picture. Um, so Sheryl Sandberg said, leadership is about making others better as a re result of your presence and making sure that impact lasts in your absence. Just from hearing you today, I am clearly inspired, but you are leaving impacts along the way. And that is so important, not only for women, also for men. But thank you all for coming and supporting Angela. Angela has done a fantastic job. But um, thank you for everything today.